Thank you for the opportunity to talk about management of the axilla after preoperative chemotherapy. I'm sorry I can't be there to do this with you in person. These are my disclosures. So we've known for many years that giving chemotherapy prior to surgery reduces the likelihood of axillary nodal metastases. That was shown in the NSABP B18 trial where patients who had surgery first had a 57% rate of nodal metastases compared to 41% in those who got four cycles of doxorubicin cytoxian. And this became clinically relevant when it was demonstrated that sentinel node biopsy was an accurate way to stage the axilla after chemotherapy. In the patient who presents as clinically node negative, the prospective GANIA trial showed us that you can find a sentinel node 95% of the time with a false negative rate of 9% performance characteristics that are very similar to what we see in the upfront surgical setting. We additionally have multiple meta-analyses that show the same thing, high rates of sentinel node identification, false negative rates lower than 10%, which is what we ex accept in the upfront surgical setting. And we also have follow-up data that shows us that the likelihood of nodal recurrence is extremely low from that prospective GANIA trial, as well as a large single institution study from the MD Anderson and one from Japan. So sentinel node biopsy in patients who present as clinically node negative should be considered standard of care after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. There is more controversy regarding the use of sentinel node biopsy in patients who begin with nodal metastases and downstage. And that's because of concerns that there might be a lower identification rate of sentinel nodes due to fibrosis in tumor-filled lymphatic channels, and more importantly, that the false negative rate of sentinel node biopsy might be higher in this setting because the effect of chemotherapy would not be uniform across all of the sentinel nodes. And we now have information from four prospective randomized trials to address that question. These studies primarily included patients with N1 disease. You can see that the sentinel node identification rate was somewhat lower than what we see with initial surgery. And most importantly, when axillary dissection was performed to establish the false negative rate, all of these studies had an overall false negative rate higher than 10%. But if we look a little more closely, we see that the technique of lymphatic mapping had a big impact on the false negative rate. If both radiocolloid and blue dye were used for mapping, then rates, false negative rates fell substantially compared to single agent mapping. And when three or more sentinel nodes were retrieved, false negative rates fell to below 10%. And we see that illustrated in this meta-analysis of biopsy-proven node-positive disease treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then undergoing sentinel node biopsy. If only a single sentinel node is retrieved, the false negative rate was 20%. With two sentinel nodes, it falls to 12%, and with three or more sentinel nodes to a very acceptable 4%. So we ask the question, how often do we actually avoid axillary dissection in node positive patients who receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy by looking at a consecutive series of 630 patients treated between 2013 and 2019? Of those patients, after neoadjuvant therapy, 573 or 91% became clinically node negative we were able to identify more than two sentinel nodes in almost all of them, 93%. And of those, 237 or 45% had a nodal pathologic complete response. So overall, we were able to avoid axillary dissection in 41% of biopsy proven node positive patients by giving them neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And if we look at predictors of finding two or more sentinel nodes in multivariable analysis, you see that as BMI increases, the likelihood of finding more than two sentinel nodes decreases, and that lymphovascular invasion was also a strong predictor of not finding three or more sentinel nodes. But things like age, 
palpable adenopathy, tumor stage, histology grade, and receptor status did not predict the number of sentinel nodes identified. Now, it's no surprise that the likelihood of avoiding axillary dissection, which requires a nodal pathologic complete response, was strongly related to ERPR and HER2 status being lowest for hormone receptor positive HER2 negative patients at 20% and highest for hormone receptor negative HER2 positive patients at 78%. So when we look in multivariable analysis at predictors of avoiding axillary dissection by both finding three or more sentinel nodes and having a PCR, we see that subtype is strongly predictive, that lymphovascular invasion remains a negative predictor, and that high-grade tumors are more likely to avoid axillary dissection than low or intermediate grade tumors. So recognizing that neoadjuvant chemotherapy is not a great approach in ER-positive HER2-negative patients, can we identify subsets who are likely to benefit from chemotherapy in terms of downstaging their axilla? So we looked at 301 biopsy-proven node-positive ER-positive HER2-negative patients who received neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The nodal PCR rate overall was only 15%. It was lower in lobular cancers than in ductal cancers, although this did not reach statistical significance secondary to the number of lobular cancers. But you see, if we selected out patients that had luminal B-like characteristics, namely they did not express the progesterone receptor and they had high-grade tumors, a third of those had a nodal PCR compared to only 8% of those who had PR and had non-high-grade tumors. And when we retrospectively compared the likelihood of getting a nodal PCR in patients who were selected for neoadjuvant endocrine therapy compared to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we see, first of all, that the patient populations are different, as you would expect, that neoadjuvant endocrine therapy patients were older, were less likely to have high-grade tumors and were more likely to have lobular histology. They got endocrine therapy for about four and a half months, and the nodal PCR rate with neoadjuvant endocrine therapy was 11% compared to 18% in the patients selected for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, not significantly different. Now, up until very recently, one of the unanswered questions about sentinel node biopsy in patients who downstage with neoadjuvant chemotherapy has been how good is local control? Because the randomized trials all required axillary dissection, so they provided no data on this question. <coughs> there are now four small studies that have addressed this with follow-ups ranging from two to five years, and nodal recurrence is uncommon seen in 3% or fewer of patients. The largest study, 234 patients, is a study that we did and presented at San Antonio in December that I'm going to show you in a little bit more detail. <coughs> As I mentioned, all patients had biopsy-proven positive nodes, which were not routinely clipped. We defined pathologically node negative as no residual tumor, including isolated tumor cells. There were 234 patients with a median age of 49 years, a median tumor size of three centimeters, and 61% of them were HER2 positive, 18% were triple negative, the remainder were ER positive. And you see that at a median follow-up of 35 months in the 204 patients who received radiotherapy postoperatively, there were no regional recurrences. <coughs> There were 29 patients who were not radiated, either because they were participating in a clinical trial or because they refused, or in some cases, their physician chose not to give them radiotherapy. One of these 29 patients had a combined breast and axillary recurrence. The four-year distant recurrence rate was 6%, reminding us that the biggest risk that these node positive patients face is not local regional recurrence, it's distant metastases.
So looking at some practical issues in sentinel node biopsy after neoadjuvant therapy, should the nodes be imaged? Is clipping of nodes necessary? Do we need to do axillary dissection for micrometastases that are found after neoadjuvant therapy? And is sentinel node biopsy appropriate for locally advanced breast cancers? So let's look at each of these. If we start with, can you accurately identify patients who should undergo sentinel node biopsy with imaging after neoadjuvant chemotherapy? The answer is no. In the SNFNAC trial, they prospectively included axillary ultrasound after neoadjuvant therapy. You can see that the false negative rate was 47%. This is a retrospective study that we did looking at axillary node status on MRI performed both pre and post neoadjuvant therapy. And you see that in patients who had normal appearing nodes to start with, which remained normal appearing after neoadjuvant therapy, 19% of them still had nodal metastases. If the nodes started out looking abnormal but became normal, a third of them had nodal metastases. And even in those patients whose nodes looked abnormal and stayed abnormal, 43% of them had negative nodes. So neither MRI nor ultrasound is valuable in making decisions about whether or not to perform a sentinel node biopsy, and we simply use physical exam. Now, a question which is very often discussed is whether or not clipping the positive node decreases the false negative rate of sentinel node biopsy. And that idea came to us from this study at the MD Anderson, which retrospectively looked at patients who had sentinel node biopsy, patients who had removal of the clip node, or patients who had removal of clip node and sentinel nodes. And with the sentinel node biopsy alone, the false negative rate was 10%. It fell to 1.4% with removal of the clip node and the sentinel node. But what was perhaps most noteworthy about this study was that the clip node was not a sentinel node 23% of the time, which would seem to suggest that all nodes should be clipped. But there are a number of problems with this study. The sentinel node biopsy technique was not optimized. 40% of patients had single agent mapping. And as I showed you a few minutes ago, you can decrease the false negative rate by using dual tracers. The mean number of sentinel nodes removed was only 2.7. And again, by removing three sentinel nodes, you can decrease the need for axillary dissection. And the downside of clipping nodes is that it can be surprisingly difficult to retrieve them regardless of whether you use seeds or wires to try and localize them. As illustrated in these three studies, the clip node could only be removed between 63% and 80% of the time. So if you clip your node and you can't get it out, that would imply that you need to do an axillary dissection even if those nodes are negative. So the policy we have adopted at Memorial for post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy sentinel node biopsy is that we always use dual mapping. In patients who were node positive to start with, if we find only one or two sentinel nodes, we perform an axillary dissection even if those sentinel nodes do not contain metastases. We do not routinely place clips because they're difficult to get out, and we think that a high level of evidence that they're beneficial when optimal mapping is performed is lacking, but we are doing that study right now. However, we get a number of patients who come to us with clips in their node, and if the clip node and one additional negative sentinel node is retrieved, then we do not perform axillary dissection. Now, an important question in patients who are getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy is whether or not axillary dissection is necessary when only micrometastases or isolated tumor cells are left in the sentinel node. We know in the upfront surgical setting that the amount of disease in the sentinel node is predictive of the likelihood of additional nodes containing metastases. And that if you have micrometastases or isolated tumor cells in the sentinel node, only 10 to 20% of patients will have additional non-sentinel node metastases. And a randomized trial has shown us that it is not necessary to perform axillary dissection in this setting. 
But things could be different in the neoadjuvant setting because when you have isolated tumor cells or micrometastases, it could mean that there was only a small amount of tumor in the sentinel node to start with, or it could mean that there was a macrometastasis and this is what's left that was resistant to your neoadjuvant therapy. So to address this question, we performed this study where we looked at patients who underwent axillary dissection after neoadjuvant chemotherapy and examined the likelihood of metastases in non-sentinel nodes based on the size of the sentinel node metastasis. There were only six patients with isolated tumor cells, too small to draw any conclusions, but one of these six had four additional positive nodes in their axilla. But notice that if you had micrometastases in the sentinel node, 64% of patients had additional positive nodes, which was no different than the likelihood of having additional positive nodes when you had macrometastases. And this was true across all subtypes of breast cancer from hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, HER2 positive, and triple negative. And these micrometastases are prognostically important as illustrated in this study from the National Cancer Database, which is looking at survival outcome after neoadjuvant chemotherapy based on nodal status. So the best outcome is in patients who were completely node negative, shown in this blue line. The worst outcome is in patients who had residual N2 or N3 disease, shown in the purple. But notice that patients who had isolated tumor cells in the yellow, micrometastases in the green, or N1 macrometastases all had a similar outcome. Now, there is almost no information on local control if you leave micrometastases behind, but in this one small study that I found of seven patients who had micrometastases after neoadjuvant therapy and did not undergo axillary dissection, two of them experienced a nodal recurrence at a median time of one year after sentinel node biopsy, strongly suggesting a heavy disease burden. So at this point in time, Axillary dissection should be considered a standard practice for patients who have micrometastases or isolated tumor cells identified in the sentinel node after neoadjuvant therapy. So what about the patient with locally advanced breast cancer? We've seen some dramatic responses to neoadjuvant chemotherapy in advanced breast cancer. Is sentinel node biopsy appropriate? And we examined whether or not the likelihood of obtaining a PCR varied based on having a T4 tumor or a non-T4 tumor or N1 nodal disease, N2 or N3 nodal disease. And as you see here, PCR rates were not significantly different in locally advanced versus non-locally advanced breast cancer the likelihood of PCR is determined by the biology of the tumor, not the extent of disease. But we have almost no information on the accuracy of sentinel node biopsy in locally advanced tumors in the upfront surgical setting because those patients were not included in the initial sentinel node studies. But here are three small studies in inflammatory breast cancer, which certainly raise major concerns with false negative rates of sentinel node biopsy of 18 to 25%. So to address this question, we are performing a prospective single arm study in which patients with clinical T4 or N2 or N3 disease undergo, who become clinically node negative after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, undergo dual mapping and sentinel node biopsy followed by completion axillary dissection with the aim of prospectively determining the false negative rate of sentinel node biopsy in this setting. And we hope to complete this study within the next few years. So to summarize what I've told you about axillary management after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, in clinically node negative patients, sentinel node biopsy results mirror those seen in upfront surgery, and this should be considered the standard of care. In patients who start out with nodal metastases, 
Sentinel node false negative rates are greater than 10% unless more than two Sentinel nodes are retrieved. Until very recently, outcome data was lacking. We have some now, it looks good, and I would call this an emerging standard of care. At this point in time, axillary dissection remains standard for any residual tumor in the nodes and for patients who present with T4, N2, and N3 disease. And although I didn't talk about this, it's worth noting that radiotherapy has not been shown to be equivalent to axillary dissection plus radiotherapy in the setting of patients who receive, receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy and cannot be considered a substitute until the results of the clinical trial asking this question are available. And then finally, I wanna conclude with asking the question, what is the optimal strategy to avoid axillary dissection, which is our goal? In patients who present with palpable biopsy-proven adenopathy, neoadjuvant therapy is the only option. These patients were not included in Z11, Amaros, or the other clinical trials of upfront sentinel node biopsy without axillary dissection. But in clinically node negative patients, is it best to operate first or to give neoadjuvant therapy? And it should not be a surprise that the answer to this question varies depending on which breast surgery you're doing and ERPR and HER2 status. So this is a retrospective study we did of almost 2,000 patients. And I'm showing you a multivariable analysis in which we controlled for patient age, clinical tumor stage, and lymphovascular invasion. And you see that if you have an ER positive HER2 negative cancer and you're having breast conserving surgery, if you give chemotherapy first, you triple the likelihood of having an axillary dissection. Not a good approach. In contrast, if the patient is HER2 positive or triple negative, and remember these are all clinically node negative patients and they're undergoing a mastectomy by giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy you reduce the likelihood of axillary dissection by 75 to 80%, and this is a preferred approach. In patients who are having breast conserving surgery, there is no difference in the likelihood of axillary dissection based on whether you do surgery first or give neoadjuvant chemotherapy first in this clinically node negative subset. So in conclusion, management of the axilla is increasingly complicated, the optimal approach to the axilla varies based upon the breast procedure being performed, whether or not there is palpable metastatic disease in the axilla, and ERPR and HER2 status. But what we can all conclude is that axillary dissection is no longer the standard of care for all node positive disease. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>